I want to welcome all of you to the 17th episode of Stefan Frank's photo book show. And for those of you who are new uh, in this series, Stefan looks at recent and not so recent photo related books that you might know or might not know about. Uh, Stefan is an artist living in Germany and he teaches a variety of classes uh, for us here at Struhl Media Life, from landscape photography to Gestalt to surrealism. And um, today's photo book show is called Photography and Painting, Examples of an Intricate Relationship. Uh, I'm Anja from Struhl Media Life, uh, and we have uh, live online photography classes. And I want to thank you for joining today. Um, before Stefan uh, gets started, I want to tell you a little bit about our upcoming classes, our fall classes. Mm, we have a photography history class coming up with Dortje Fink, highly recommended. Uh, it's called Photo Exhibitions That Made History and What Can We Learn From Them? We also have several mini workshops coming up. Mini workshops are one hour classes single session, one hour workshops uh, for only $39. We have one coming up about uh, photo books, uh, photo book design and printing with Edward Ratliff. Um, he will also actually teach an in-design class for people who want to design their own photo books or zines. And then Stefan will also teach a mini workshop. It's called the artist's sketchbooks, uh, sketchbook um, ideas and tools for the practicing photographer. And Stefan will also teach uh, another class related to surrealism in photography. All of these classes are starting uh, in, in over the next uh, weeks and couple of months. Um, <clears throat> I will be teaching my monthly critique group that starts this Monday. There's one spot left. Uh, and we'll also have a Lightroom class coming up, uh, a, a photo collage class with Susanna Pustayova, uh, and um, and a class uh, where we will watch film clips to inspire you, and we will then analyze those film clips from movies from all around the world, uh, but you will then go out and take stills. Check out our website uh, to find out what fall classes are coming up. All right, um, and we also do give out scholarships uh, from time to time. We announced uh, the scholarship recipients today. You can see them uh, on our Instagram for fall scholarship. Um, if you have questions, you can unmute or you can uh, put the question into the chat. The talk will be about an hour or 75 uh, minutes. And um, yeah, uh, I want to, as always, thank you all for being here and also especially thank Stefan for yet another episode of his photo book show. So, um, Stefan, enjoy. <clears throat> thank you so much for this introduction and thanks to everybody who has been uh, who is here today. I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces and also happy to see some new faces here. Um, so and let's jump right in because we are talking today not about photography. Just let's start with the title. I, I always go back and forth with Anya about the title. Uh, so the title that I come up with are always very, uh, you can't really understand what I'm meaning with that. I totally get this when Anya says, okay, nobody will understand that. Um, so this is not a photograph. Uh, and the, the reason why this is not a photograph is a good title for that because this comes out of some sense of frustration that I, that I had uh, because I was visiting an exhibition this summer. Um, and let me start with a, with a quote on that. So this is a quote from, from Lucas Blaylock. He is one of the, the authors of one of our, uh, of the, the the books we will be looking at today, um, American photographer who somehow works at the border between painting and photography. And in his book, he writes, uh, I get impatient with photography sometimes. It can seem so narrow. I want for it. And this is his frustration. My frustration comes from this. Uh, this summer, I've been to, to Copenhagen uh, and I've been to the Louisiana Museum, uh, which is a very beautiful museum near the, the Öresund Sea, a couple of uh, 
just half an hour, 45 minutes away from, from Copenhagen. I can take a train out there. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful museum. And uh, when I was in Copenhagen, I did not want to, we didn't want to go there. Uh, we saw there was an exhibition by Ronnie Horn, which I saw was not so interesting. And there was this guy, Franz Gertsch, um, Swiss painter, uh, and the exhibition uh, outline was not so fascinating. Some pictures that I've seen in a, in a catalog there, some pictures I've seen on the internet, that was not really impressive. And good for me, we still decided to go there because otherwise I would have missed that because uh, this was a fantastic, fantastic exhibition. Um, Hans Gertsch is a Swiss painter. Uh, you can, if you happen to be in the, in the vicinity of, of Copenhagen, you can still uh, go into this um, into this exhibition. Um, and this is what I meant when I when I looked at these these uh, photos. When you go to the uh, website of the Louisiana Louisiana .dk for Denmark, uh, you will see all these kinds of pictures. And when you look at this picture, it looks like yeah, this looks like an ordinary photograph. Uh, but when you actually go into the exhibition, uh, it still looks like an ordinary photograph. But you, uh, the first thing you notice is that these photos are big. So they are huge. They are much larger than life. Uh, this is where the, the title comes from. Um, only when you step closer to uh, the images, you see, yeah, this is not actually a photograph, but this is actually a painting. And the way Franz Gertsch works is he's ta he takes um, photographs with a 35 millimeter camera uh, on slide film. And then he projects these photographs onto an empty canvas. And what he then does, he meticulously repaints the photograph he sees uh, projected onto this, onto this empty canvas. And this is what makes these photographs so spectacular. And I, I was like this, like this woman that you see here. I was photographing these, uh, these paintings, these elaborate paintings, um, like she did. And I ended up with things that eventually look again like photos, but they are not. They are these tiny little details. This um, it sometimes takes him. Uh, weeks or months, sometimes even years, to complete one of this these paintings, where he really elaborately uh, paints every thing that you see here. And these are photos he has taken in the seventies. He was uh, in this in, in this alternate alternative scene in in Basel, um, where he was photographing uh, the the folks he was hanging out with. Uh, the the blue jeans they everybody was wearing, the records everybody was listening to. So these are very mundane vernacular situations, uh, situations that uh, you capture with your camera in a, in a blink of an eye, in a sixtieth of a second. And uh, the fascinating part of this with this moment that he tries to hold on to, this, this moment of his life that was just fleeting, that was just moving away from him. He captures this and then he spends, he stretches this uh, millisecond of time uh, onto a week, onto a month, onto a year, while he was painting this, uh, while he was painting these photographs. And this is something that you need to to experience. You be, need to be in the same room. You need to change your distance to the uh, to the painting. You have to go far away like this to see. I this is when it looks like a photograph. When you go closer, it starts getting into something that is more abstract. That is just smudges of paint. Um, but this is something where you have to experience it in a museum and have. Um, different distances to the image. And I wanted to buy a, a catalog of this. And I looked at the catalog and the catalog was totally boring because it went back to the idea, yeah, now you have a photograph photo, uh, projected onto a canvas 
then repaint it. And then you have another photographer who takes a photograph of this canvas and puts it into a catalog. And suddenly somewhere in between this process of photographing, repainting, re-photographing, uh, suddenly all the magic was gone. Something has vanished from this, from this catalog. And um, today, what I'm trying to do with, with some of these examples that I brought was I'm trying to find out what has vanished there. Um, Hans Gerd, as I said, he, he spent an endless amount with these, with these paintings here. And uh, they originate from uh, a photograph and he was so um, mad with his detail that you even here see that he repainted the ISO noise. Uh, that you get from the that you get from the slide frame. You see that probably in the in the back of the image here that he actually repainted the the noise of the image. Like every camera that does not decide what's important and what is not important. Every picture just collects everything. He didn't censor anything. He didn't censor that uh, this um, the stubbed out cigarettes that you see on this on this plate here, the dirty the dirty dishes, a plastic cup, uh, everything was captured by this photograph, and he did not decide that this is not important or this is important. He just reproduced it, and every item that you see in this photograph, every um, item got the same attention from him. So he spent as much time with a stubbed out cigarette as he. Um, spent with the face in here. So, and this is how he works. So he spent this, uh, he worked a uh, whole his life. He, uh, he got, uh, he became 92 years old. Um, and he had this platform that he moved up and down to, to make these elaborate paintings. Uh, he later went on to photograph um, in the, in the forests, uh, photograph, um, simple uh, simple things like grass that you see on the left here. And he repainted these, these photographs. And when I looked at these photographs and when I try to figure out what has been, what is gone here, what is missing here, I, uh, I remember this, uh, this pivotal essay by Walter Benjamin. He said that even the most perfect reproduction of a work of art is lacking in one element, its presence in time and space, its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. And today we will be looking always at these push and pull relations between photography and painting, um, what is happening in there. And if you look into the, into the history of paint, uh, in, into the history of photography, photographers appeared on the scene when there was no photography. So this is uh, the, one of the first uh, photo books that you see here. This is um, The Pencil of Nature by William Fox Talbot. He was um, one of the pivotal figures on in the technical development of photography. The, uh, he invented the um, negative positive um, way of developing film. Uh, that was used through most of the time in, in the 20th century. And immediately when he started, he was, um, he saw not only the, uh, he saw the potential of photography, not only as an artistic means, but also as a commercial means. So he was very much into developing a process that allows you to reproduce uh, photos uh, for a mass audience. So it was only logic logical for him to then move on from developing the positive negative process, then to inventing the idea of a photo book that you can send out to people. And this was is one of the first positive negative photos um, that he did. Uh, this is also one in the book. But he was also fascinated by these kinds of displays of intricate forms of um, things that are extremely hard to paint these reflections on the glass that you see here this is there is so much going on in these in these photos in these details that you see here that he eventually said one advantage of the discovery of the photographic art will be that it will enable us to introduce into our pictures a multitude of minute details which add to the truth 
and reality of a representation, but which no artist would take the trouble to faithfully copy from nature. And this is something that he wrote in, in 1844. In 1844, and if you look at Franz Gerd, little did he know that there was actually an artist who would take the trouble to faithfully copy, not from nature, but actually from photographs. This is what basically what Franz Gerd did in his in his paintings. This relationship between uh, the commercial side, the commodity side of photography, this was uh, pretty much what was going on with, with photography from the very beginning. Uh, here we're looking at a picture from uh, taken by Berenice Abbott of Jenna G, of course, uh, who lived uh, at the turn of the century and worked in, in Paris. And he moved to Paris to actually earn money with his photography. Um, he started with supplying documents for artists, studies for painters. So this was the first one who had a working, uh, this was a, one of the first photographers with a working relationship to, to painters. And they he supplied them with things to paint from. He also supplied architects um, to uh, supply them with examples of their work or examples of intricate details of, uh, of their houses. Stage designers used his photographs to uh, fabricate uh, stages for, for the theater. And today we look at his images as some piece of art, but in the in the beginning when he was working this, this is this is just plain product photography that you see here. So when you uh, an, are an artistic uh, blacksmith, like the one who did these iron wrought um, staircases here, you can go to, you could go to Eugene G and say, make me a photo of that or that I can show that to my customers because I'm, I'm doing this kind of stuff and this will help me sell stuff. So he was working at the time uh, with these kinds of photographs. So for he, uh, for example, he photographed wheat and sold it to a painter. And then the painter would go on to look at his photo and see exactly how wheat plays out on a two-dimensional plane. And he was working in a time when uh, the Industrial Revolution started an enormous um, enormous output of uh, of goods that were prefabricated in in, uh, in factories. And once you have uh, once you can have this these prefabricated goods that were not made by uh, single artisans by, but by a machine, you have to sell them somehow. And the way it was sold at that time, there were these, uh, hand-drawn images, uh, these these engravings that were produced. And of course, when photography came into play, it was very quickly that photography took over this job of making these catalogs. And here we are seeing um, a vintage picture from a toy catalog. And there you see the difference between photography and, and painting. Uh, it is very easy to make pictures and to capture all this minute detail, just as uh, Fox Talbot predicted. And then you can print it into catalog. And here was the first thing, uh, the first thing how photography was used. It was used to sell stuff. So we all know the story that came after that. Uh, we went from painting to look at who we are and what we can buy to uh, phot photographs to look at who we are and what to buy. It was very quickly that in the 20th century, um, photography became the dominant medium to talk about commodities, talk about uh, news that happened in the world, talk about history. And that was a change that, of course, also affected painters. A lot of painters that were doing this kind of product painting they were out of a job. They were just replaced by a photographer. Uh, strangely enough, that does not that did not mean that painting got away. It just released them to do other things. The 20th century became uh, photography heavy and painters picked up on this. So this is a work of the madman Gerhard Richter. He was, uh, Richter was a German photographer who worked in the um, who is still alive, he's 92, 
now. Um, and he was um, madly collecting all kinds of photographs, be it from family albums, be it from catalogs, things he tore out of a, of a magazine, out of a newspaper. Uh, he was realizing that this is the, ecos the ecosystem that makes up our lives. And the pictures of, of things, the photographs of things were, student, uh, were very quickly replacing the actual things. So a large portion of uh, when you have uh, kids in the 20th century, the first cow they saw, they probably saw not out on the fields, but in a picture, in a photograph. So he was collecting all these uh, vernacular photography from, from photo albums because he was realizing this is what makes up our, our environment. And he was not only interested in what you see on the, in the images, but he was also interested in what are the, the textures, how does the reproduction, the circulation of photographs, how does it change these surfaces? This is where what you need a, photo, uh, a painter for, because he's interested in the materiality of how a photograph appears on a, uh, in a newspaper. So not all of these images, but some of these images eventually ended up in paintings by Gerd Richter. Uh, one uh, cycle uh, that I want to show you from him is 18th October of 1977. Um, this was a period in Germany that was um, where we had the uh, Rote Armee Fraktion, Red Army Faction, that was a terror group uh, that um, killed a lot of politicians and inflicted um, an autumn of terror uh, in Germany. And this is how you got to know these people. The first thing uh, I remember this, um, I was pretty young at that time, I was 10 years old. I know these pictures because they were everywhere. They were hanging in, um, in the supermarket, they were hanging in the pub because uh, there was a great effort to capture all these terrorists. So their faces were present, they were everywhere, although you never saw them, you never actually saw these people anywhere. They were uh, dominating with their aesthetics, uh, with the way they reprinted their, uh, the pictures of the um, hostages that they captured. They were dominating not only the, um, the political discourse at the time, but also the aesthetic discourse at the time. These cheap um, photocopied uh, aesthetic that you see here on one of the, the pamphlets that they put out. This was uh, very, a very important element of how the 70s felt at that time. And although I was 10 years ago, I still remember all these pictures. So they were imprinted on the, the public consciousness uh, of, of Germany. And Gerhard Richter took uh, of course, he collected all these images in his atlas, and he looked at these mugshots, but he looked at these mugshots from a different point of view. He looked at them from a, the point of view from a painter. What does this painting, uh, what does this portrait say about this, uh, about this woman? These are uh, mugshots of Ulrich Meinhof, one of the um, terrorists that were searched in these, um, uh, with, these, uh, with these billboards. And he was fascinated not only by pictures of her, but also how these pictures appeared on the screen, these halftone images that you see on the that you see in the uh, in the newspapers. So he collected all these uh, terrorist pictures because he was inquiring what da what do these pictures say about our political situation that we are in. And how does the circulation of all these pictures, how does it affect our consciousness? And as I said, this was uh, the, the 18th October of 1977 that gave the name to the series. It was the day when uh, four of these terrorists that were uh, captured in the, um, in the prison in Stuttgart Stammheim, uh, they committed suicide under, until this day, not fully uh, resolved circumstances. So no one really 
uh, it was never really resolved how this happened. They killed themselves within uh, their imprison. And he took these photographs and he repainted these these photographs. And the interesting thing that you that you see in his work is that he is repeating these photographs. So he not he did not paint one photograph, but he painted uh, three of these. Uh, photographs. Here we see uh, Gudrun Enslin when she was um, when she was captured, and he was not only painting um, her face, and he did not he did not clear up her face. He reproduced also these smudges that you often see on on papers when uh, things are not really clear. He reproduced these kinds of technical imperfections of uh, of the technical uh, of the technical reproduction he photo he repainted these these vernacular um items that you saw uh, there were circulating images of the uh, of the record player that one of the um terrorists had in their in their prison cell and this ends up as a very plain and simple picture but of course all these pictures were part of the larger story of terrorism. This was the record player in which the gun with which um, Bada shot himself was smuggled into his prison cell. So he was always inquiring about the face value of these images. What do we see when we look at this image? And his painterly labor in there added something to this, to the circulation. What he was actually doing, he was trying to pull out all these images out of their new circulation, out of the technical reproduction, and put them back into another context. And this is why you see always these pictures repeated again and again and again. And uh, this is one of the of the photos that he painted, one of the, the paintings that he did from, from mug shots. Uh, this one is always something that you ha actually have to experience yourself when you uh, visit his pictures in an exhibition there. Uh, this is one of the um, early pictures by uh, of Ulrike Meinhof when she was still very young and he repainted this because it was uh, smeared all over the tabloids all the time. So this was this is the face of evil that you are looking here. And what he is trying to do, he's trying to give back some of the complexity that uh, photographs lose when they are circulating through the newspapers and through the magazines. So what he was actually trying to do, he was trying to give them back um, what Benjamin in his uh, seminal work, uh, the artwork in the times of its te technical reproduction, what he, what Benjamin was calling the aura. So the thing, uh, this, this presence that an actual painting has and that a newspaper image does not have, that you have some kind of distance to a thing that actually exists physically. And with this prelude, I want to jump into the into the um, into the actual books that we were talking about, because this is the background of this. This is always the play between photography and painting, the play around where does the aura come from and where does it go? So I already mentioned Benjamin, uh, if you do not yet know his essay on the artwork in the time of its technical reprodu reproduction, I highly recommend to reread this again and again, like Victor Bergen does, which is one of the sources why, why I started looking into this because there is an English um, critic, Victor Bergen, um, an artist also um, who wrote this tiny little book, Returning to Benjamin, which is a, contains a wonderful essay where he revisits the work of, of Walter Benjamin, who is just this um, pivotal figure in, in, the tw in the beginning of the 20th century and who is still relevant today. So I recommend both of these books. Uh, shout out to Mac for, for bringing back these, this essay from Victor Bergen and another shout out to 
back from making this ridiculously uh, expensive because it's really a really tiny essay here. Um, so this just, if you're interested in the te theoretical background of this, of what we're talking about. So let's get into the, into the actual books here. So one of the artists that I've been, um, that I've been looking at, I'll actually show it to you in a chrono chronological fashion. So this was the, the first book I, I got from, from James White. Uh, I picked that up because I opened it up and said, okay, yeah, wait a minute, this looks like a photograph. And I was intrigued by this, by these photos, because when you, when you zoom in here and go really, really close, you eventually see it is not a photograph. So it's, it's actually a painting. And James White puts these, um, I hope you can see this, he puts these, uh, his images, uh, where he also always, most of the time, he starts. Um, uh, he, he most of the time starts also from a photograph, and he transfers this photograph onto uh, a canvas. But he makes sure that you s uh, see that this canvas is an actual object. So it's, it's when you see this here, he paints on. Pretty much everything he can get his ho uh, he can get his hands on. This is a piece of wood where he mounted his images on, um, and then he puts the whole image into uh, a plexiglass container. Um, why does he do that? So the the idea behind this is, once you do that, you move away first from the photograph by painting it and then you move away from the painting by making it uh, going away from the two-dimensional object that the painting that we how we perceive a painting usually but you move it into a third dimension into this piece of wood and into this box here to make sure yeah this is an actual object this is something that you can have a distance to and I'm just showing you this because this was my, sometimes these things get tossed out. I got this for cheap in a sale here. Uh, it's not a very good printing, has a wonderful essay by David Campany about this, uh, but the, the printing is not so impressive. Um, this is another book of James, by James White Buddies. Um, I think when whenever we look at how Painters organize their work. I think they work. They they organize their work not in what we would call um, projects. So they organize it uh, this way. Uh, they organize it in in different ways. They organize it around exhibitions. So often you feel you find things like um, exhibition catalog that groups. Um, certain paintings. Um, they deal with things in a um, by going through some formal things that they want to show. So let me look at James White. This is another book by him that he called Buddies. Uh, again, this started out as an exhibition, and this exhibition always groups together. Uh, work that he did that he did through a certain period, and then it's collected and exhibited. So, he uh, the pictures that you see here, the the actual images that you see here, they are connected not by um, a common project, not like by I want to document uh, how glasses are produced, but he is more interested in informal things. So this is an interesting image where he said that he is he's calling the large glass because it is obviously a large glass. So sometimes these titles that he gives his pictures they are very they are very mundane, but they have a second layer to them. So here is interested in informal things. So sometimes he just cuts the canvas in two parts and 
cuts these two photographs, there are clearly then, when you remember the, the original scene, these are two different um, these are two different aspects that are somehow connected. We see here something like it's it's the same window latch that you see here. But between these two pictures, uh, the camera moves and then he brings these two pictures together. And suddenly these two vantage points that you have on this window that they, they suddenly clash. So he is interested in these kinds of formal things that happen on the uh, with the painting with uh, with an artwork here. Um, he often paints part of his canvas in a just in a plain color in a white color here. So this is something that is lost in the reproduction that you actually see. It is hand painted here. So part of this is reserved for the a copy of a photograph and a part of it is reserved for um, an even painting here. Sometimes he is interested when you cut a picture, when you start with this formal approach to cut your canvas into parts, you can also do this with a reproduction of the same image here. So what he does here is he has the same, uh, he has one photograph, but then he paints the, the upper part of this slightly at an angle to uh, add a movement to the, to the lower part. So he is interested in these kinds of formal things and he uses the uh, materiality of the canvas and his laborious process of reproducing the mundane photograph with his careful reproduction in painting to talk about these kinds of formal processes that go on on the canvas. And when you go through the images, you will find all these kinds of different uh, of different formal things here. Like here he's um, playing around the idea, he's always in a tradition of still life painting. When you look at still life painting, what it means for, for painting, they uh, you can go back to the Flemish uh, still life painter that were uh, always where painting a glass or painting a chalice and painting reflections was also uh, was always a kind of showing off. This is how what I'm able to paint. And he's also, um, he's using this, he's, he's placing himself in this tradition with this kind of reproduction of, hey, look at how masterfully I'm able to uh, reproduce the um, weirdest, most complex reflections with a minute detail in painting. And for this, he uses, uh, Another here he uses, uh, for this he uses different materials like glass, mirrors, paper sometimes. And here he's introducing another formal element by tilting the camera. This is why he calls this from the position because his position is slightly raised. And you see here, this is what painters do. They are, uh, they are, um, they are so focused on these tiny little details that happen on these canvases because they spend an endless amount of time with these uh, with these uh, with these canvases. Um, I want to point out that in contrast to this book here, which is slightly well, not so great printing, this is great printing. This is a very glossy paper that brings out the contrasty image is very good so it's very good printing here so and I want to go to some of these things so I have no idea if this was James White's idea of this or this was the idea of the painter but this is a um, wonderful idea that he had you see that we are in the <coughs> excuse me uh, that we are in the middle of the book so the middle of the book has the stitching in the middle 
So what you see here is he's picking up on this idea that you have the same uh, that you have the same mid, mis, uh, image and you cut it in two parts. So you uh, cut your canvas here, what you see here, in basically in three parts. There's the left part, there's the middle part, which is occupied by this gray bar here, and there's the right part. And the interesting thing about this here is that it's in the middle of the painting here. And here you see that the page breaks. So you have all these blotches in here that comes from uh, the breaking varnish of, uh, of the paper. And this adds something that we will encounter later. It is an alienation effect. So suddenly you see, okay, we're not looking at a photograph of a painting, but we're actually looking at a book that contains reproductions of photos of paintings. So now there open up another layer of where you suddenly see uh, that, that brings you out of this um, um, spectac spectating photograph into becoming aware that this is a book, this is a reproduction, and we're not looking at the actual painting. Let's jump to this one here. Um, as I said, he's been constantly dealing with the um, the artistry, the mastery of uh, photographic technique. This is why he's always dealing with different materials like glass, water, plastic, mirrors, paper. This is what painters do. They struggle with capturing these minute details, these, uh, how all these little wrinkles in the paper are formed. And this is something that is fascinating to go from a photograph that is where it is so easy to capture all this to a painting where this is a, an extremely laborious process that you have to go through to reproduce this. And as I already said, he's always thinking about these different levels, photography, painting. And for this, this is one of the, the key, what I think are the key pictures in here where it just starts to, where all these levels are starting to implode. This is a locker and the locker in the original image, it has been painted. So there's somebody actually going in there and doing a bad paint job on the locker here, on this door here, on this door frame. And now here is another level. There's somebody applying paint to something then you make a photograph of it, then you make a projection of it, then you make inside this projection, you make your painting, and then you make a photograph again. So you, we go through all these levels here. And what these levels do, they start a circulation that always go back to open up a dialogue between the painting and the photograph. And Great book that has three great essays in here. And you probably wonder, what is this about? What are the images about? What is he trying to talk? What is he trying to tell us with these, with these images? It's an image of a glass. And the interesting thing about the essays that are contained in this book, uh, you get three different persons that have three different answers. Um, there is even a short story in here, in in the end, which is a great, great short story. I will not um, repeat it for you to to make sure I don't spoil it. But it's a it's a story about two brothers and her father uh, and their father uh, that has uh, vanished, and he has left behind uh, photographs, and. The photographs are on a film that is extremely laborious to process because it is uh, the, the 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 process to develop it is hard to reproduce and it has gone out of fashion. So they find one printer that is still able to develop it, and this is where the story ends. So everybody who looks at this image sees something else. Sometimes you see it's remnants from a crime scene or it's the things that just surround you, look around you and you see things like this on your window, uh, on your table. Like I have a glass on my table, so it's very close to us. There is 
these are the things that make up your immediate um your immediate surrounding here so everybody who looks at it has a different idea about this and it depends on the context of how you experience this and this is why this is what brings us to the next book here this is another beautiful book by pains me to say but it's again mac um this is evidence and you probably know evidence by uh, the original version of evidence the original version of evidence was made by Larry Sultan and Mike Mandel was in 1977, and they went through uh, archive photography from scientific institutes, uh, government institutions, uh, the highway patrol, the fire brigade, um, and they picked out of two million pictures that were in these archives. Um, they picked 59 pictures and put them together in a book and removed all the context from it. So these were books, these were pictures um, from scientific experiments, from machines, from ordinary things. Like here is a thing where you can think about, okay, what was it in the beginning? And Larry Salton and Mike Mandel, they did this without any comments. So they just put the pictures in here without telling you, what do you see in this picture? And uh, James White, he took on this uh, he took on this project, and he applied all his formal ways of looking at images and used them on these pictures. So here, uh, deconstructing it, um, adding another level of interpretation to it, um, reframing that cutting them in half, adding a different layer, adding a layer of paint in the middle to it. Sometimes doing nothing to the image, but just picking out a different, uh, a different part of the frame. Sometimes here, this is in the original, this just continues here. And even this is a wonderful print job because when you move over this, you see, okay, it actually is a different painting that he uses that Mac has been using for this. So this is differently painted from the actual photograph. So this is James White, and this is the original photograph. In the original photograph, it just continues here. He just added this uh, uniform layer of black here. Sometimes he just blotted out what you actually see here. And the wonderful thing about this, that this becomes a tactile, this adds a tactile dimension on this. You cannot see that but you can feel it that they that he has done something to the pictures sometimes he just you see another paint job in the middle Let me look for my easter egg hope i find it again No, I've lost my Easter egg. Ah, here it is. Here's my Easter egg. I just wanted to show you this Easter egg. Sometimes what he does is this had a different picture. So what you see here in the the bottom left corner is actually a picture of James White himself. So he replaced the picture that you had here from another person. He replaced it with a picture of himself. And so great book, and it's a great take on the original um, Larry Salt and Mike Mandel book, Evidence by James White. Let's move on to to the to this one here. So. 
as I mentioned, I already mentioned Gerd Richter. So um, sometimes these, these dialogues, these conversations between painters and um, and photographers, they take on the, uh, they come from a curator's point of view on work by different uh, by different uh, people. This exhibition brought back, uh, brought together the, the works of Gerhard Richter, the painter, and Michael Schmidt, Michael Schmidt, the photographer. And they both circulate on, um, they both uh, circulate around the color gray. Um, Michael Schmidt once said that he perceives gray as a color, and he was um, in his in his early work, um, Einheit and Waffen were a ceasefire. He was working predominantly in, in black and white. So he talked about the color gray in a way that he thinks that it is actually a color for his work. And the this is an, just an exhibition catalog um, that shows the, uh, the posters, how it was advertised, shows you these uh, large exhibition rooms. And the interesting thing about this is um, Gerhard Richter is eventually ending up with a painting. So in, in contrast to a photograph that does not have a defined size, you can print your painting in the size that you want or that you find suitable for, for the occasion. You can have a tiny little print in a newspaper that is only this high, but you can also print your images like this in contrast to a, uh, in contrast to this, a painting always has a defined size. You have to decide on the canvas before you start. So, while well, Gerhard Richter has to decide, um, Michael Schmidt had the option to print his images in different sizes, and this is what he did for this for this exhibition. And this is an interesting um, brings interesting aspects. So Gerhard Richter painted these monochromes paintings of gray. It's just a canvas covered with gray. So it's another painterly take on the color gray. And of course, um, this is just in a book, it's just a gray page. But if you put it on a canvas, it gains a different quality. It suddenly has um, something of an object. It has a defined size, it has a defined uh, you can have in a gallery space, you have a defined distance to it. So it gains, regains this kind of aura to it. And for this kind of aura, which is always an, an, a thing that requires two parties to join, so the artwork itself and the viewer to it. Without the viewer, you don't have an aura because it is always about the distance to it. So this means once you hang your grape picture on the wall, you have, uh, you produce some kind of aura. And as I mentioned, I already mentioned um, Atlas and the way that they both, uh, Gerhard Richter circulated around this, um, around this idea of an ecosystem of images. And Michael Schmidt, they were living in the same area, uh, in the same time, in the same place in Germany. So they had this very German experience to them. So they had a similar um, a similar archive of images in their head. So Michael Schmidt died in 2020, uh, in uh, 2024, no, can't be. Um, so this is a picture that uh, Michael Schmidt pulled out of his archive. So in his books, he directly reproduced, um, he re-photographed uh, photographs. So they have a different way to deal with archival photography. While Michael Schmidt was photographing, uh, Gerhard Richter was painting. So that's an interesting approach to bring this together in an exhibition. And Again, this is something that is good to think about this, this concept of this, but these um, pictures of the exhibition spaces bring me back to my initial frustration that you actually want to see this in the gallery and you want to stand close to this and have a distance to this. So 
great book that brings together three great um, photographer and a painter together. And now let me end on, on this one. And um, this is by Lucas Blaylock, and I have to warn you about this this, uh, this book because this is not a book, this is a rabbit hole. Uh, Lucas Blaylock is an American photographer and he is famous, he became famous actually for being bad at Photoshop. So what he does, he starts with um, very beautiful, um, large format photography uh, still lives. He scans them, puts them in Photoshop, and then he applies. So then he goes contrary to how pretty much everybody else uses Photoshop. So everybody else tries to hide the fact that they are using Photoshop. And this is what you see when you when you open up um, when you open up uh, a magazine, everything is Photoshop that you see in there, but everybody tries to conceal this fact because Blaylock goes the opposite way. He uses Photoshop, but he uses it in a way that you, actu uh, that you actually see that he's using Photoshop. So he makes sure that you always see that. And as I said, this is one of the rare cases where you where you can find some of the paintings from, by Lucas Blaylock outside of a gallery settings. There are not so many books that are um, that at least are available here in Germany. This is by uh, Objective Press. I think they sit in in Belgium. Um, they produced this um, very um, very useful um, book that contains not only the images by Lucas Blaylock himself, but also everything that he has, uh, that he was inspired by. And he's always inspired by pretty much everything he sees, not only photography, but also painting. Um, this is why you see, this is why you find pictures by Philip Guston here, or by Maria uh, Lassening. You also find uh, photography by Carrie Mae Weems in here. You find uh, photographies of the um, of the interventions by, of David Hammonds here, and he also describes his thought process in here and uh, how he got to that. And as we have already seen this image of Lucas Blaylock, he laboriously um, explains about uh, René Magritte and. Uh, this is why I said I have to warn you about this because you will spend a lot of money on getting the books that he's referencing here. So he is referencing here um, the period, uh, the, the per La Période Vache, the cow period of René Magritte. This was very influential and I did not know that. We all know the pictures by René Magritte. I did not know that René Magritte was eventually tired of himself and of his wonderful paintings and of his very photorealistic style. And he made these period wash paintings um, with the intent to paint as poorly as possible. And he made this fantastic, uh, wonderful pictures here that are go really go back to his, his early days when he was learning to photograph. Uh, to to paint, and he was not influenced by he was influenced by the things surrounding him, by the comics that he saw. And thank you, Lucas Blaylock, for pointing this out. Uh, and I got this this book here, and there's a whole lot of other books in here uh, that I still have to work on. And let me go back to this, what, what they share, what James White share and Lucas Blaylock share. They both share this reference to Bertolt Brecht. So the title here comes from um, a play from Bertolt Brecht uh, at the end of the Three Penny Opera. There is um, a mounted messenger that writes in and explains um, and basically he releases uh, McKees from being hanged at that point. And that is something that is totally alien to what else happened in the play. And this was something that Brecht 
intentionally introduced as an alienation effect, what he called verfremdungseffekt. So he wanted to make sure that the audience was not sitting back in his in their chair and forgetting that they are in a theater and they are discussing something. They want he want uh, Brecht wants to pull them out of this spectacle and make them aware of their situation, of the situation of the theater, of their own situation, of their own social situation. So this is why he used this Verfremdungseffekt to get out of this, yeah, you sleep and you're just spectating something. And when you look at the techniques that Blaylock used, he is using Photoshop for exactly this kind of alienation effect. He wants to take you away from the idea that you're actually looking at a photograph here. You're looking at something else here. So you, he does not want you to look at him, at his face off when he, when he smokes, but he wants to look you, he wants you to look at the actual uh, object that he created here. And this is why he is referencing here this, this alienation effect of Brecht in the beginning here. So a dangerous book to read. I can hi only highly recommend it here because it will probably make you a poor man or woman in the end because you have to read and get a lot of these books. And this brings me to the end. So thank you all for your patience and for being here. And please, if you have any questions. I posted um, the links to the books into the chat. You could uh, copy them from there in case you want to check any of them out. Um, are there any questions from anybody? Yeah, please, please go go and get this this book. This is um, I'll, I feature a lot of these uh, Mac books, and they don't need any more advertisements. But people like Lucas Blaylock and these books, I think they need more advertisement. They have to be visible because they are they otherwise get lost somewhere so you have to be lucky to to find them uh, stefan thank you again so much for this lo lovely lovely conversation on art and photography and this particular one was more of a ping pong match <laughs> back and forth <laughs> and and one thing ran through my mind during this whole presentation um um do you think Vermeer would love this style had he thought about it? If there was if there was photography back then? Well, I don't that that is an excellent question. I've been just, let, let let me try uh with let me try it with Caspar David Friedrich because we've been talking about Caspar David Friedrich in uh in our landscape course just now. It's and for this I've been looking at uh Caspar David Friedrich for a while. And the interesting thing about Caspar David Friedrich is when we look at his images, um, at first glance, they appear totally realistic. So you, you remember probably the, the wanderer above the, the fog. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's an actual scene. You see a person standing over uh, in the mountains and looking down uh, into the fog. And once you start... Um, once you start looking at the uh, at the images closer, you see that everything in these images is constructed. Nothing fits together. So the lighting is not correct. Uh, the way the shadows fall is not correct. And actually, Caspar David Friedrich never left his studio. So he painted these, these spectacular landscape scenes <laughs> uh, from within his studio in Dresden. So he looked out of the window into the harbor. So nothing that you see in there is, I don't know what you what you can call it, real. And this is always when I when I look at painting, it, paintings in like like Vermeer or Caspar David Friedrich, they, they look so realistic. But this is um, they have always been about imaginary places about painting things not outside of your head, but uh, things inside of your head. And I don't know what he would solve, what Vermeer would think about stuff like this, which goes where you look at this and say, what, 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 the heck's what is actually happening here in this picture? Hmm. 
it's just bad it's just bad photoshop you see two figures here and they are just the the outlines are painted in with the brush tool in photoshop so what does it mean i don't know what the mayor would have made out of this but he has also these these tiny little mysteries in all of these photos and his attention to detail and this going mad about tiny little things in his images like this pearl earring there so i don't know it's an interesting question i would love to ask him <laughs> make that too <laughs> stefan um i have a question i'm always interested in you know book layout and design and all of this um, how do you feel about this one that's uh, right there right now, the size of it, for example? This one? Mm -hmm. uh, this one, I think, is great because it's it's a combination. So this is not actually a photo book. It's, it's more like um, a work a workbook because it contains some pictures, but the pictures are not. They are only here not to to actually look at the picture, but they are only here for reference. Yeah. So usually you would read the text, then there is something mentioned in here, then you go into the internet and hunt down the picture in the internet. And here you just have it at hand. And for this, I think that that is a perfect format here because it's it's a lot about, there you go, the mayor again. Um, this is a perfect format because it is very good for, for reading this kind of stuff. And not having to go into the internet to look at the picture that is actually talking about here. So I no, I'm not sure it would be good if it is if it were bigger. And this is something I can show you with stuff like that. Like this one here. When you have longer pieces of text, I am not a great fan of this. This is what you always get with with uh, with photo books that have a larger format for the pictures, but then you add uh, end up with this kind of text block that occupies a whole lot of space and it's just hard to read. And for this, if you have longer pieces of text, this is just this just works better for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really nice size, the yellow one. Yeah, yeah, and it's for for the reproductions still pretty good, pretty good print here. Mm -hmm. So you can at least you get an ex, uh, you get an idea what the what the picture is about. Of course, it again it's it's with uh, it's with Lucas Blaylock, like with any any other of the artists we've been looking at. These are mostly artists that you have to see in a gallery. So I would not I think something something like this here, this does not qualify as a photo book, it's just a catalog. It just collects pictures. So all right, Stefan, thank you so much. Um this was really very inspiring. And also uh, I will definitely check out uh, Lucas Blaylock more because I don't know his work very well at all. So this was really great. Thank you so much for pointing all that out. Um, last chance for a question. Otherwise, I want to thank you for being here. Um, uh, Anne, you have a question. Hi, uh, yes, a question for Stefan. Could you? Rephrase the comment you made about the appearance of text in uh, the uh, in in the photo books that you you just showed. I mean, the last photo book you showed. Yeah, sorry, I just lost my light, but I still we still have this in mind. Thank you. What I meant with the appearance of text is, um, it's it's good to see this side by side. Um, here, the page is much smaller. And the, the actual type type is, is bigger, is larger. So this makes it easier to read. So when you have things like that are very text heavy, like this is, because he's talking a lot about his, his, his process, how he got to his pictures. 
where this is just an accompanying essay to the pictures that you see up front here. So the front is important, the size of the pictures is important. So this determines how big the, um, the book is and not the text. So you have to have some compromise. So you have a large, uh, large area. You have to have a. You have will have a limited number of uh, pages for the book. Uh, otherwise, it gets too expensive. So you have to print your typo small, and you have to make it run wide. And this makes not a pleasant read. It's hard. It's harder to. It's just harder to read. And this is not something like this. You do not want to hold something like this uh, in the evening in your bed when you want to read something. And this is what, why I think, so this works better for reading and this works better for looking at pictures. Hope this okay. answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, then. Um, Stefan, when is the next photo book show? <laughs> when is the next photo book show? Uh, next month. Okay. And we will be jumping off on this. We will be talking about uh, Ernst Haas Abstract. Brilliant book just came out. Uh, it came this morning. So fresh off, hot off the press with a uh, wonderful article by David Campany. And from okay. this off, and it's the other side of painting, photography, but now only for photographers. I think it's time for David Campany to join uh, one of these uh, sessions since you have some kind of text or book by him uh, over, almost every single time. Well, I can't help it. He's everywhere. So Yeah, no, it's good. Very busy man. So Yeah, he is. I know. Uh, David Campany, you should also check out his Instagram feed, actually quite interesting, really amazing, the stuff he posts, very, very inspiring. Thank you so much for joining us, and um, I hope to see you uh, next month, probably towards the end of October or beginning of November will be the next photo book show, mm -hmm. because in between we will be in Santa Fe for a workshop that we are running together with Kai McBride and Sam will join us, right, Sam? Absolutely. Okay, very good. All good right. Very good. Ciao. Good seeing Thank you, you Stefan. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.